So there are limitations to this approach, and um, this is never really brought out. But the huge limitation is this is based on contemporary data. And we'll look at some population histories later on here, and you'll actually see that there are many population histories that are written in Native Americans. And simply because all these names don't appear at this particular period in, for example, the Cherokee, doesn't mean that they weren't there in some time in the past. It doesn't mean that there aren't names that have gone to extinction um, because there are a lot of variants and we're just seeing, this is, this is much like reading a Sherlock Holmes book, well not reading a Sherlock Holmes book, but reading the last chapter and then from what's written there, trying to reconstruct all the nuances of the plot of a Sherlock Holmes book. That would be difficult. And mitochondria are much more than population markers. They're actually very, very dynamic. Sometimes we get the idea that genes don't move, that it's just what we, you know, get that stays with us. But they can, they can be dynamic, as we've seen with um, um, pathology, that you can get mutations, but that probably doesn't apply here. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, the guy that's really responsible for all this, and that is Father Abraham. Just to illustrate some points of, of groups that move. So Father Abraham here um, started out from Ur. He came across the Fertile Crescent, and he ended up somewhere in Palestine. Now, what's interesting about this, and I think this comes into play with the Promised Land, is that when Father Abraham went to Canaan, he didn't go to Promised Land Retirement Villa. There were people there. There was opposition. So when you go to a Promised Land, it's just not like, you know, go there and play golf until the second coming. That's, that's not how it works. But from a population perspective, um, let's go back to the city of Ur. So this may be what, like, the city of Ur looks like when Abraham was there. People are at the market, they're shopping for leeks, and maybe they're going to go hear um, a reading of the Epic of Gilgamesh um, that, that evening. But what I've done with, um, with Abraham is I've taken some of these people, I've pulled them out. So if you think of the gene pool of all these people, I've taken a very restricted number, a kin-associated group. They've gone somewhere else. Now, just because you're Abraham, and you left your population, doesn't mean that God hits you over the head with the wand and says, oh, I'm going to change your genetics, so you're unique. No, we're all pretty much like, for example, in this room, we all look very much European, and we would probably all be X, um, mitochondrial type X. So this is, this is what happens to Abraham. So he leaves um, the area. And this is what we call a genetic bottleneck. There's just no getting around it. So if you think of a genetic bottleneck, think of a and um, I think I, I better thank Farms for this, because this is one of their articles, and I just chopped it up. But um, so you have an old-fashioned pop bottle, and you have variation in here that represents all the people. And then Abraham is going to leave, so you just pour a couple of these guys out. So you don't have what's representative anymore. You have a subset of this. So we have a genetic bottleneck um, already. But now let's, let's step ahead 1,200 years to Jerusalem and to the outskirts where we have a small kin-associated group, such as Lehi and his family, who've left, who've left for a promised land. And um, once again, this is a kin-associated group. So we've had Abraham in the land of Cana, Canaan, I mean, there's been population histories for that um, 1,200 years. Um, just, we just, we just don't know. So even probably the signal from Abraham is lost, once again, in the intermarriages that may happen. Maybe they all looked very consistently the same. This is the problem you run into if I was to run over to the ancient Near East today and say, let me look at these Israeli and Palestinian populations. This is what they looked like 2,600 years ago. Just doesn't work that way. And the literature um, actually is very cautious about that and says, you know, we have to be very careful how we reconstruct these ancient lineages. 
So we have this kin associate group, Lehi and friends, and they leave. So we have a, another bottleneck. And they're out here wandering around in the wilderness, and of interest there is that they're out there for eight years. Now, there's things called infant mortality rates and that type of things. You don't have modern medicine. You don't have physicians. You just can't um, drive into the emergency ward. And if you're going to die, you generally die. So there's probably, again, um, genetic reduction that occurs naturally in these small kin associated group. Not everybody lives. Not everybody has sons and daughters. And it's more acute in a small group like that. So they can tend to go to what, again, we call fixation rapidly. Um, but probably I, it, it, it shouldn't have, have happened here because it was only eight years. So when we travel to new lands, the things that we always take with us are our genes. So we take our nuclear DNA, we take our mitochondrial DNA, and it's all a certain amount of variation that comes along in a little cup. In fact, if you look really close, Sarah is holding this cup. <laughs> but in, anyway, you, you are alive out there. Um, so what happens, um, I think, well, let's not go to that yet. I just want to say a couple things about um, Promised Land. Um, so, we believe that they sailed over to Mesoamerica and landed somewhere in this area. And this uh, wonderful graphic is courtesy of, um, of uh, Blake and Joseph Allen. But let's talk just a minute about the Book of Mormon and what it has as the promised land. I know that we all believe that they went to a land where there never was before man. At least that's our traditional understanding of, of what that means. But if you look really close at Second Nephi, I mean, I think it seems like sometimes we tend to get carried away. Um, it's sort of written in covenant of Abraham language that says those brought out of the land of Jerusalem. So a very specific group of people. They'll prosper. They'll be kept from all other nations. They'll possess this land unto themselves, but the conditions always are that the laws and statutes are respected and lived. So the promised land idea is really associated with the covenant of Abraham and does not cover some of God's other children that are living in this new world. In fact, you can almost think of Lehi's group as a boat of missionaries. Why not? bring the covenant of Abraham to a new land, um, 